Did you develop the cleft and the jawline from years of badassery, or did you just come out of the womb with this? Oh, I got issued that once I joined the uh, SEAL team. Just gave you a buzz cut, like, like a kiss from a badass angel. Really excited to have our next guest on because uh, his book is actually a book we handed out as a handbook here at Ladder with Crowder for people and new hires. It is Extreme Ownership. He's uh, one of the co-authors of this. Uh, he also has the Jocko Podcast at jockopodcast.com. You can follow him at Jocko Willink, uh, retired Lieutenant Navy SEAL, uh, more medals than we can mention, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, also founder, I want to make sure I get this right, Echelon. Echelon, front, 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 leadership firm, consulting firm. He's, he does so much, it's incredible. But this book is something that's really been uh, pivotal to this team. Jocko, thank you for being on the show, sir. Thanks for having me on. I, well, I'm very glad to have you on. You're an intimidating character, so uh, I hope this goes well and I get on your good side. Um, for those who haven't yet read the book. Yet, yet to be determined. Yes, to be determined. And usually it doesn't bode well for me. Um, for those who haven't yet read the book, uh, meaning people not in the lot with Crowder Company, and I highly recommend it, can you, can, can you help them understand, d define what extreme ownership means? Yeah, so extreme ownership is the attitude, it's the, it's the mindset that you're not going to blame anyone else or anything else when something goes wrong. You're actually going to take ownership of whatever that problem is, and you're going to get that problem fixed. And I know it sounds relatively simple, but it's actually pretty hard for people to do. So wh why do you think it is hard for people to do? Like, what would be some prime examples of that for people, you know, not the Navy SEAL crowd, more so the stay-at-home crowd? Well, one of the hardest things about taking ownership when things go wrong is you have an ego and you don't want to admit that something is your fault. And what you'd rather do as a human being is just blame other people or blame the circumstances or blame the market or blame anything else. Yeah. And when, you, when all you do is sit around and blame other people and other things, then guess what? That problem doesn't go away. It just usually gets worse. Right. So that's the that's the idea of extreme ownership. There's something going wrong. I'm going to take ownership. It's my responsibility. I'm going to get it fixed. And even the truth is, and I, I think you talk about this in the book. Sometimes it is somebody else's fault, but it doesn't help you because you can't control them. And you, you talk about ego quite a bit. And funny thing is, I I actually came to know you through some interviews about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I don't know how I stumbled across you, but you were talking about sort of combat arts versus some of the, uh, I guess, shall we say, less effective martial arts. But it was very respectful. But I could read between the lines. Um, you talk quite a bit about ego when you discuss the combat sports side, and we've had Joe Rogan on, Daniel Cormier just last week, uh, Tim Kennedy. They talk a lot about how ego uh, clouds, it destroys. Can, can you define that a little more clearly for people who may not know when you're talking about ego and how to avoid that specifically? Yeah, well, the, the problem with ego is if you've got a big ego, and, and I'm not talking about having no ego, because right. if you have no ego, if you're Daniel Cormier, you've you got to think that you're going to be the champion. You've got to think, you got to believe that you can make it happen. But you have to counter that with some level of humility where you say, you know what, I'm not the best in the world. I'm, the, the person that I'm going to be fighting is, go, is going to be awesome, and I've got to be at my best game. So what does that mean? That means I have to train hard. That means I have to prepare. I have to do everything in my power to be ready for this fight. If people lack humility, then they say, oh, I don't need to train hard because I'll be able to I'll be able to beat this guy anyways. And then guess what? They get beat. Yeah, it happens all the time. We had George St. Pierre on the show and he talked about how he was terrified before every fight. And Daniel Cormier said that in his mind, he was going through excuses right before Miocic of why he should lose that fight. You know, ah, he's 255 pounds. I'm, I'm really a middleweight. He said that. He was very candid on the show, which is something else that I noticed with really successful people. Having been blessed enough to interview people at the top of their field, um, once they get there, they tend to be candid. You have the exceptions to the rule, but they tend to be transparent because I don't know that they have a lot of time not to be. Um, let me ask you this. How do you differentiate then? This is a tough question. We've talked about this on the program. How do you differentiate between ego and a realistic assessment of your abilities, particularly if you have abilities that are greater than average? Well, I'll tell you right now, most people that, are, that end up in a position where they're greater than average, they're not sitting around saying, oh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the greatest in the world. They're like Daniel Cormier saying, you know what, I could, I could lose this fight. They're like George St. Pierre, paranoid and scared before every fight. The guys that think they're just going to win every single fight, they're, they're, they're the ones that end up getting caught earlier in their career. And right. even somebody that comes across as having a massive ego like, like Conor McGregor, if you watch how Conor McGregor uh, actually trains, yeah. he's training 
like he wants to be the best. He knows he's got weaknesses in his game, and he steps up to cover those weaknesses. Yeah, there's a difference between selling fights and you know your your lifestyle. Uh, let me ask you this: What do you think the line is between you? Kind of mentioned like George St. Pierre, fear, almost a little bit of paranoia. Where's the line, especially as someone who's in the military, and obviously you're afraid when you're going into a firefight and you could die. Where's the line between fear, paranoia, and and using it so that it's productive? So there's there's definitely a difference between fear and respect. And I, I wasn't afraid of the enemy, but I respected the enemy. And I realized that they could do some things that could surprise us and catch us off guard. And that's something you have to deal with. If you don't respect the enemy, which I guess, you know, if you're not afraid of the enemy at all, if you don't, if you just think you can dominate the enemy, well, then you start cutting quarters. You don't train as hard. You don't prepare as much. When you do that, you're going to lose. Yeah. You see that with almost every great fighter, right? The tail end of their career isn't usually their age. You look at guys like Mike Tyson, the tail end of their career is usually they just, they get complacent. Um, I think a lot of people miss that. They just think, oh, he got old. And you look at him like, well, actually, he was, he was 35. He was 35 at this point. Not Mike Tyson specifically, but it happens a lot. And they just get to, you know, you get to a point. It's, I think it was Jeff Danaher who said, it's hard to get out of bed at six in the morning when you're getting out of silk sheets. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that sort of crystallizes that perfectly. Um, and no, the same thing happens to businesses, too. You know, businesses that, you know, because we work with businesses all the time, and as the business grows and they start to feel like, oh, we're going to crush the competition, the competition can't touch us, and then the next thing you know, there's someone that's younger, some business, some company that's smaller, and they're younger, and they're hungrier, and they're working their tails off, yeah. and if you're sitting on the top of the hill, you don't think you need to work anymore, the next thing you know, you're getting eaten. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a good point. It's happened right now with late night. You know, great example. You've seen these late night wars and people become so complacent, just take their audience for granted. And then all of a sudden it fractures and uh, we draft in right behind them. We have no business doing it, but we're doing OK. And I think that's actually a, a big difference between a job in the military and, and employees who often might read this book in the civilian workforce is um, the ability to ignore something if it's not on your item list. Right. You see that a lot. If it's not my job description, well, it's not my fault, whereas in special forces in the military, if you do that, you, you, you could die. Um, and I know you talk about primarily leading by example and taking active ownership and consequences with action. So how do you balance leading by example, what you're talking about, taking extreme ownership, um, being assertive with hierarchy and respecting leadership? Because the two are both, they're both important. Yeah, they're both important. And for, for one thing, you know, when people talk about the military and you think, oh, well, I was in the SEAL team, so every SEAL is just going to take ownership of everything. And, and they're going to they're never going to say that's not my job. And that's actually wrong. Right? Uh, and it's wrong across every group of human beings in the world. Sure. They're all human beings, first and foremost. And there's people that are, you know, in the SEAL teams and special operations in the military in general, there's a bell curve. And there's some people at the high end of the bell curve that work really hard and and are really gifted and they go out and kick ass and there's some people at the bottom end of the bell curve and they're trying to skate by and see what they can get away with and then there's a bunch of people in the middle in various various degrees that that fall out somewhere on that spectrum so even in the military it's not like oh you just do what i tell you that's what you need to do is just do what i tell you um there's there's just they're people and so whether you're in the military or whether you're in the civilian sector You've got to, as a leader, you've got to recognize that you're going to have some people that are going to be going really hard. And it's great to have those people, but there's also going to be some people that you're going to have to drag along a little bit. And obviously, there's some people that you have to drag along so much that you can't drag them along anymore. And they're starting to drag you backwards. Mm -hmm. And when that happens in the civilian sector, that means, you know, you're probably going to have to get rid of them. In the military, it means you're going to have to get rid of them. Um, this is after, of course, as a leader, you've done everything you can to try and coach them and try and mentor them and try and get them up to speed. So, you know, leadership is leadership, regardless of where you are, whether you're in the military working with an elite group or whether you're in the civilian sector. It's leadership principles stay the same. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, I think that's actually a really important point. I had a friend who was in the Marines and obviously some friends who were in the, uh, the Army Rangers. And they said, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's not exactly what you think. It does, we're not a monolith. And one of them actually told me who was, a, I think, a former Navy SEAL from a long time ago. And he said, back then, he said, we didn't spend much time on hand I can't hand combat. Everyone thinks I can kill you five ways to Sunday. He said, I learned Taekwondo with a 50 pound back backpack. He's like, I, I didn't learn how to fight. I learned how to shoot. And I appreciated again that candor. I was going, oh, okay. And then afterwards, it became a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt after the military. Um, early on in the book, you, you, you detail um, a, a story from Iraq in which friendly fire occurred. Tough story to read about for people who end up reading the book. Highly recommend it again. It's called uh, Extreme Ownership. Um, I think it's available everywhere books are sold and probably 
probably audio book. Uh, I don't know if we can get Andrew Clavin to do an audio book on that. That would be it would be soothing. It would it would just smooth over the rough parts. But as I did, I did the I did the audio book myself and Late Babin. We did the audio book. So I, I I assume that you did. But the really intense parts, Andrew Clavin has a voice that's just it it would make it sound soothing. Enemy fire, and you're like, oh wow, this isn't so. It doesn't sound half bad. So this was a friendly oh, friendly fire incident. And as a commander in charge, you did something that a lot of people wouldn't. Um, you came forward and took full responsibility for the situation, which to me was very striking. Why'd you do that, Jacko? Well, it was it was a tough thing. It was a tough thing to come to. It was a tough thought in my head. And, and as I talk about in the book, as I was trying to figure, you know, this horrible situation took place. There was all kinds of people to blame, whether they were some of my guys, some of the soldiers, Marines we were working with, whether it was the Iraqi soldiers we were working with, we were all working together, and there was plenty of mistakes that were made, and, and it was definitely a situation where I could have pointed the finger at, at, at many different people and many different mistakes that were made, and as I went through this, because, you know, my commanding officer, they're doing an investigation, they're trying to figure out who they're going to blame, Right. and as, as I'm sitting there trying to figure out who I'm going to blame and who I'm going to tell my boss, oh, you, you know, is, is, is this guy's fault, I, I couldn't figure out. I couldn't figure out who I should be blaming for this. And there's a reason why I couldn't figure out who to blame. Because as I sat there and grilled over it in my mind, I realized that there was one person and one person only to blame, and that person was me. I was the commander. I'm over and all in charge of the mission. And if something isn't done right, that's my fault and it's my responsibility. And that's what I did. I went in before my commanding officer and before my troops and said, hey, guys, this was my fault. And, th and, and here's the important part, or the other important part, is this is my fault, and this is what I'm going to do to fix it. So a lot of people, once they read the book, they say, well, if I take, if I take ownership of something, then it just disappears. And that's not true either. <laughs> you know, if you say, oh, yeah, that was my fault, and then everyone goes, oh, okay, great, it was his fault, now we can move on. No, actually, that doesn't fix the problem. Right. You have to actually take ownership of the problem, then you have to take ownership of figuring out what the solution is, then you have to take ownership of implementing the solution so that the problem doesn't occur again. So it's, it's not as easy as taking extreme ownership, but the first step is definitely a challenging one. And again, goes back to ego. For me, I had been in for, you know, 15 or 16 years at the time. And, you know, I had a good reputation as a SEAL and I'd done a good job and I'd been to combat. And now all of a sudden I'm saying, hey, this horrible thing happened, which in my opinion, a fratricide, a, a friendly fire incident is about the worst thing you can have happen. And for, for me, it was a real blow to my ego to step up and say, hey, this was my fault and I'm not going to blame anyone else. But at the same time, and there's one piece of it where in, in, a, in a leader's mind, they think, oh, well, if I take the blame for this, everyone's going to look down on me and they're going to lose respect for me. Right. But the, the opposite is actually true. When a leader says, hey, look, here's what I did wrong. These are the mistakes I made. and This is what I'm going to do to fix it. People actually gain respect for you because they realize, realize that you're not going to shirk your responsibilities. And, well, and I think maybe that brings us back to a point you were talking about before, where there are some people who might need a little bit of, of prodding along, dragging along, and uh, there are some people who you just can't drag necessarily anymore. So I think at that point, the people who can be developed, they'll respect you more. But like you said, the people who might just have to be let go regardless, it may fall on deaf ears. And that's a skill in leadership that you also have to be able to determine. You know, the people whose minds you can change, the people who you can lead. And there are some people... Uh, some people who can't. For example, we went out and people have tried to bomb our van because of our opinions. We're like, well, well, hold on. We can change this lady's opinion. Uh, the transgender who works at Juiceland wanted to slash my tires. Maybe let's let's le let that sit for a little bit. Um, let me ask you this. Do you think, too, that obviously doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, and, and combat sports, and that's very different from traditional martial arts where it's kata and, and not full contact, uh, I've definitely learned in my life it, it, it breaks down ego because you just get your ass kicked so constantly. I tell everyone it's good for a man to get his ass kicked at least once. And it sounds like false machismo, but I mean it. Do you think that's played a big part in your humility? It, it absolutely has. And that's one of the things about Brazilian jiu-jitsu for sure because you can be a 225-pound guy and roll in there to a, to a jiu-jitsu academy. And if you don't know any jiu-jitsu, literally uh, – a, a woman or a 130 pound or 135 pound woman will choke you out and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and so it is, is an absolutely extremely humbling sport to be involved with. And it's the same thing with boxing. It's the same thing with wrestling. It's the same thing with Muay Thai. If you don't know what you're doing and you step into the ring or the cage or on the mat, you're going to experience massive humility because there's nothing you can do about it. And I, I, it definitely helped me. It definitely helped me. It, it, it made me respect other people as well. Because you don't know who you're dealing with in the street, right? Yeah. You don't know who that person is. And you might be, you know, you might be 
running your mouth to someone that can actually crush you in a fist fight. Yeah. And so I think it's great for people to do. And, and a lot of times, you know, I've, I've written a couple of kids books too. And I, and I obviously in the kids books, I encourage the kids to work out, be strong and know how to fight. Yeah. And I don't think it's as time. popular as the fold out TikTok went the clock. It may not be the first book kids reach for at bedtime. Yeah. Well, the, the funny thing is, is I was on a, I was on an interview with uh, NPR okay. and but yeah, exactly. And the, the funny thing was, was they were they were saying, you know, well, there was a lot of people that the, the guy was really honest with me. And he said, you know, there was a lot of people that were concerned about having you on this program and having you talking about, you know, turning kids into warrior kids. That's the name of the series. The yeah. book series, The Warrior Kid. A lot of people were concerned about turning people into warrior kids and and teaching them about about fighting and 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 being stronger. And what people don't realize is that when a kid is strong, when a kid is confident, when a kid is when a kid knows how to fight, yeah. they're much much less apt to actually get into a fight or to get into trouble in general. Right. So, yeah, it's Or it's at the really... very least they believe, you know, this is one thing actually my good friend Henry Gracie, he teaches a bull, bully bully proof and he was on the show to talk about it. And he he said, "Listen, you can't solve the problem with young boys about self, you can't solve the self-esteem problem without them knowing that they're not going to get their ass kicked." He says, "They don't have to be the best fighter, they don't have to be the toughest kid, but almost all of the solutions right here from principles is you tell them you stop this right now. You walk up in that bully's face and you say, "You better stop it or else what?" If the kid knows he's going to get his ass kicked, it has no teeth like a parent who makes it to three and doesn't do anything and the kid runs roughshod over them people don't that is an important point knowing that you can handle yourself changes the way that you carry yourself um i'm surprised npr didn't like you coming in. i wonder if when you walked in it was a jawline and a cleft and they said we have a problem he's different from most of us you know i will i will, I will give uh, respect to him because they brought me on it was a really fair interview they the, the guy had a good good conversation with me i was i was happy to expose you know that to, to a new group of people and to to the theories that I believe in, and and the, the the interview went well, and it got a lot of listens. So I'm well, fine with it. On a serious note, did you develop the cleft and the jawline from years of badassery, or did you just come out of the womb with this? Oh, I got issued that once I joined the this, uh, SEAL team. Just gave you a buzz cut, like a, like a kiss from a badass angel. Um, let me ask you this: so extreme ownership is obviously a concept that, that anyone can apply, and you talk about that in the book. But um, I, I do wonder this, and our our mutual friend. Tim Kennedy, he was talking about this on Joe Rogan's podcast where he said it's harder to get into the military today than in college. That a lot of people just think it's take anyone and it's their last effort. He said that's actually not the case. He got a lot of blowback. And he was effectively saying that the military tests for a lifestyle versus test scores. In other words, he was saying you can't, I think his actual words were you can't get off the couch eating Cheetos and smoking pot and expect to get into the military, but you can in college as long as you do well in the tests and that subject. So let me ask you this, considering right now that there are kind of two camps, the camps of professors and feminists teaching this idea of toxic masculinity in which any kind of assertive leadership qualities are vilified. And then in contrast with the equally kind of uh, subversive faux alpha male pickup culture, do you think that more young men specifically aren't being raised today in a culture of, of extreme ownership, that it's a problem at this moment in time more than it, it before? Well, I'd say it not only applies to young men, I, I'd say it applies to young women and young sure. people in general. And, and and that being said, I have to say, you know, I still do work with the military and the young kids that are coming to the mili military right now, the young millennials who have a really horrible rap, they're they're awesome guys and they're going to go crush it overseas and they're going to take the fight to our nation's enemies. And so there's definitely a, a large group of people that are that are being raised right and going to defend the country. And at, at the same time, yeah, at, there's there's definitely. I mean, is there any question about what you just asked me, really? Is I don't know. Any? I was going to say, it almost sounded like you disagreed with me for a second, and I was going to have to say, well, hold on, hold on a second there, Jocko. Those are the guys who've made the cut, who you're seeing. I mean, they thinned the herd quite a bit before they get to you. They don't put yeah. you before in the first-round audition. You're kind of a callback. Yeah. No, but I think, I think you can look around at, at what's happening with sort of, you know, you can look at Jordan Peterson. You can look at your show. You can look at, like, my podcast. Yeah. Um, the the, the People are listening to it. People are buying extreme ownership. People are buying my kids' books. Uh, th that's what's happening. My, my other book, Discipline Equals Freedom, Field Manual. It's about, like, getting after it. That's what it's about. It's right. about taking right. ownership of your life. It's about working out. It's about learning how to shoot. It's about learning martial arts. It's about working out early in the morning. It's about being disciplined. That's yeah. what it's about. And, and that book so, sold awesome. Yeah. And so yeah. I think... I think while we're seeing, uh, I, I think while we're seeing the one side, the people that are saying, you know, you, you, 
every, it's everyone else's fault, which is basically the people that you're talking about. Hey, yeah. I, I didn't get where I wanted to be in life because of these following reasons, but it wasn't my fault. And there's a, there's a number of us in the world that are saying, actually, well, it is your fault. And when someone says to themselves, okay, did I not get into college because they didn't like me because I was X, Y, or Z? Or did I not get in college because I didn't work hard enough and get good enough grades, and that's why I didn't get in? Right. Or if I didn't get in the military, did I not get in the military because they don't like me or they don't like where I come from? Or did I not get in the military because I'm morbidly obese and – and I smoke pot every day. Like that's going to be a problem. <laughs> so, but it is. It is also beautiful, according to the billboards. I will say this: that what you talk about a lot, discipline equals it does. It equals freedom. You know, as someone I've, I've struggled a lot with with ADHD my whole life, and I mean this as a kid. They thought I was learning disabled for a period of time. I had to learn in French, French Canadian. It's a, it's a whole different story. But I was also very dumb. Uh, but I also didn't know how to. I didn't do well in a class. I couldn't pay attention. You know, I couldn't sit still, and. Um, I did later on in my life. I was I was never very I wasn't as productive in writing comedy, in 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 doing as much stand up or accomplishing what I wanted to. And when I structured my day so much, you know, got up early, gym this time, lunch this time, and I would put in windows where I could free flow. All of a sudden, because of the safety that I'd created with this box of discipline, I felt more like picture it like pong is how I describe to people. Boop, boop, I'm free to bounce around in here because I have two lines. Otherwise, I'm just going to bounce off the screen and never come back. And I think a lot of creative types resist what you're talking about because they think they'll lose their creative edge when in fact it's the opposite. Yeah, it's the complete opposite. The, the, the example I always use with that is Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin and Jimmy Page, you know, before he was in Led Zeppelin doing what he does with a guitar, which as you know, is completely insane. He was a studio musician that was playing the notes that were dictated to him really complex. And he did that for years. Yeah. And so if you want to have the freedom to rock out Led Zeppelin style, then you need to have the discipline to practice for thousands and thousands and thousands of hours to get to that level. And it's this, it's the same thing with any, it's, you know, it's a creative, in a creative world, it's the same. In a, a regular business structure, it's the same. In a team, it's the same. And in your individual life, it's the same. The discipline that you have in all those categories will give you freedom in the end. And you know, actually, another a good story for you for when you're doing these business seminars. I don't know if you've ever read Alice Cooper's biography. But you know, Alice Cooper was an addict and was obviously a crazy person and changed his life. He's, he's a scratch golfer now. He's actually like the best golfer on the Pro-Am Tour. But he actually, before every single show, he lists his routine. And he said, I realized that I was kind of rushing, 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 just rushing along the day and then going in, out and going on stage. And I wasn't giving my best performance. And so what he does is he goes into his green room. Uh, he takes a 30, I think 30 or 40, he outlines it in his book, a 30 or 45 minute nap where he said, I shut off the lights. It doesn't matter if I sleep. I shut off the lights. No one is in there. I get up. I have one chocolate chip cookie. I don't know why. And I watch kung fu movies while I put on the Alice Cooper makeup, and pe and then I get into character. It's like, and they do this routine every single show. It may sound odd to us, but that's extreme discipline for Alice Cooper. I mean, when you think about what he used to do, and he's doing as well as ever. Um, okay, speaking of which, what would your top three examples uh, be? Do you think of extreme ownership men throughout history, or a couple that come to mind? You know, I, I mean, George Washington's right up there. You know, he could have walked away at any time and said, look, we're going to get up against a military that's too strong and too organized and too well funded for us. And we're just going to give up. Um, Abraham Lincoln, same way. You know, I mean, there's plenty of times for him to say, OK, you know what, we're, 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 this is too much. And, you know, he fired all kinds of generals and, and kept driving forward to to make things happen. Um, you know, my my favorite military leader is actually a guy named Colonel David Hackworth, who was a, he was in the Korean War, he was in Vietnam, he wrote a, an incredible book called About Face, and he was one of those guys, he's a very controversial figure, because mm -hmm. towards the end of the Vietnam War, he got interviewed, and he was, he was one of the most decorated soldiers at the time in, in the Army, and he went on an interview, and he said, um, the way we're fighting this war, we're not going to win it. And and, and, and the army, you know, the army, they, they pushed him out of the military in a matter of weeks and he was blacklisted for many years. But as we look back at the Vietnam War, we see that he was right. And right. he was one of the few guys that had the, the intestinal fortitude to stand up and say, look, the way we're doing this is wrong. And so I, I think that person that stands up, takes ownership of the situation, regardless of what it's going to mean for their personal outcome is uh, is a good leader to me. I, you know what, I was going to, George Washington immediately comes to mind. And I know people say, oh, that's so cliche. And I go, well, hold on a second. Uh, a country that left the world's greatest superpower ever 
the, the British Empire to become the world's greatest superpower ever. The that's never happened before or since. One century that occurred. And George Washington, I think important to add to what you just said, you know, could have walked away at any time uh, when he was facing a very powerful military. And it's also just as important, he walked away when he had all the power and people didn't want him to walk away. Talk about ego. That's a guy who said, this is consistency with my position and what I believe this office to be. That is why George Washington is right up there with me. And then on a personal level, Teddy Roosevelt. I'm not a huge fan of him necessarily politically, but if you look at his life, the strenuous life and how sickly he was as a, as a kid, um, uh, I think he's a good example. Okay, fi final question for you. And then I know we do have to get, go get going again. It's extreme ownership. People, you can buy it wherever you buy books. I don't even need to say People say, hey, Amazon, Barnes, wherever you buy books, buy the book. Um, my grandfather was an Air Force uh, fighter pilot. Career was a, a, a colonel. Uh, High-level military service and transitioned to, you know, the civilian sector. And it was kind of a challenge for him. And I know you work with a lot of people like this. How are you able to navigate from an environment with, with the most serious of stakes, you know, life or death, um, or help people like my grandfather to then the business world or, or the entertainment industry as you're doing. How do you make that transition? Because I, I know it's got to be a, a hard one sometimes and a bit, a bit of a kind of leveling off and figuring out the levels of intensity. It's, it's not everyone who can do it. Yeah, well, being in the business world, it, be, being in the military in the first place, yes, it's very intense. You have a great mission and you're very driven to accomplish that mission. The stakes are very high. And in the business world, I tell people all the time, because people ask me the same question, you know, how can we come at it with the same kind of intensity? And when I tell people in the business world, especially business leaders, is, look, in, in the military, we're, we're dealing with lives, but in the civilian sector, you're dealing with livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And you as a leader of a company, you know, if I don't do the right thing and make the right moves and I don't stay humble and make things happen and get aggressive when I need to get aggressive and back off when I need to back off, well, I've got 20, 200, 2,000 employees that are counting on me to make the right decisions so they can feed their families. Right. And that is a heavy burden. And you know, it, it might not be the exact same burden that you get as a leader in the military where you, the actual lives of your men are at stake, but in the civilian sector, you know, if you, what is life? What is life? Life is, hey, I'm gonna take care of my family, I'm gonna, I'm gonna feed them, I'm gonna give, you know, give them a roof over their head. That's what I'm doing as a, as a human, that's, that's my goal. If I take, if you take that away from me, you, you've kind of taken my away my life. You've taken away my livelihood, and that's problematic. So there's pressure on both sides, and and that's why being a leader is is a hard thing to do. There's a there's a heavy burden of command in both situations. As opposed to you give a roof over their head, as opposed to Bill Cosby who would answer that give a give a roofie over their head. Oh, that's yeah. a problem. So we don't want to be like him either. Not an extreme ownership guy, Bill Cosby. No. Um, but no, I I think that's that's important to note. And you know what? Uh, ha having uh, running a business myself and employing. Uh, Gosh, I don't know, a dozen to 15 people. And uh, my wife's father, my father-in-law employs about 50 people. It, it really does change things. It's, it's like a family. And uh, they have to look out for people who they provide for. Eff effectively, these people rely on them to make a living. And uh, they're not looking to harm those people. And they've had to make some pretty tough calls. People who, people who they really like, you know. Uh, my father-in-law had to make, I remember, some decisions that were really, really just torturous for him. Um, okay. Yeah. This book is Extreme Ownership. The author is, jo well, let me get your Twitter correct here. Uh, is it? It's Jocko Will Link, two L's, L-L-I-N-K. The podcast is JockoPodcast.com. Uh, Jocko, I know that you're going to get a lot of young men who are going to read this and are going to be inspired, and you're going to get a lot of young women who uh, are simply going to want to get a phone call back from you. So, you know, be ready for that. They can run that through my wife and four kids. Uh, I think that they'll probably try and find you directly. Our female fans are very aggressive. We've turned the tables on Al Gore and used the internet to our advantage. If you like this video, subscribe by hitting the subscribe button or the notification bell next to it because subscribing isn't enough. Watch one of these other videos and, uh, you know, listen, you can, you can stick around. You don't have to. But here's the thing. The fact that you're still listening to me saying stick around, as I say stick around and you're sticking around, ah, we just added another ad. You just made me for more sense.